Hello, hello. I hope everyone's having a really great week. It's been an interesting week. I've been getting a whole lot of questions following uh, a change that has been made to the way that medical students are evaluated. That's something that happened this week. And so I'm making this video to sort of explain what the change was and to offer my insight on the questions that I've been asked. There have been many, many questions from a lot of different stakeholders. Um, and this is something I'm really passionate about, so I thought I'd sit down and make a unscripted rant about it. <laughs> so, here's the background. USMLE stands for U.S. Medical Licensing Exam. So, this is an exam that is offered by the National Board of Medical Examiners, which is a... Um, they're responsible for the USMLE step one, two, and three, which you have to take to become a physician. And uh, so, sort of the function of this exam as a, as a sort of pure thing, it is, it, it's, it's what the name says it is, right? It's a licensing exam. When you go to the DMV and you take your driver's license test, it's, it's a pass-fail type of thing. If, if you pass your, your competent enough to be on the road and not be a harm to the country. Um, and if you don't pass, you might have a bit more studying to do. Um, the USMLE, however, is a little bit different in that the step one of the exam, there are three steps, step one, two, and three are reported in, um, in units, in actual measurable units, a three-digit score. And residency programs which have a high ratio of applicants to available spots, tend to use the step one score very heavily to stratify people. Now, if you look at the actual data, which are publicly available on, um, uh, on, 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 uh, on online, if they track this every year, you'll see that not every specialty is the same. Some of them have an average accepted score of 240, which is really high. Others don't really care and have an average score of, uh, or a 10th percentile score of 198, 200, 204, where a pass is 196. A pass on this exam is, is 196. So as you might imagine, there's, there's, uh, it, it plays a large role in the lives of medical students because just like the SAT is used for college admissions, MCAT is used for med school admissions, the USMLE 1 is used for residency admissions, and it's more heavily used in some of the really um, uh, some of the specialties that have a high ratio of applicants to uh, to available spots. So I just took some notes to make sure that I uh, stay on time here. Okay. So in medicine, medical education today, there are some serious problems. One of them is that there's a huge rate of medical student burnout, depression, and suicide, or whether you define it as huge, it's disproportionate relative to the general population. And so there are a lot of initiatives to try to figure out how do we do this. Um, some schools will uh, give out grants for students to do wellness activities. Some provide gym memberships. Most schools have a mental health counselor. But in a broader systemic way, uh, medical educators are trying to figure out what changes can we make to the system to make it less deleterious to people's health. And two, two or three years ago now, I think it was that the uh, INCAS committee, and I don't remember what it stands for, was put together at the NBME, um, or may have not even been, uh, no, it's, it's from the NBME, and their job was to figure out, should we make this USMLE reported as pass-fail or keep it at a three-digit score? The significance of that would be, if it's pass-fail, you can't use it to stratify applicants. Um, but at the same time, applicants can't use it as a, hey, look at me, look how high my score is, because we're only getting pass-fail. And they deliberated on this, and they met in December to have like a real decisive powwow about it and they came out a few days ago and they announced that it's going to become pass-fail in uh, 2022 or no earlier than 2022 is what they said. Um, 
And before I get into the people's reactions to this, I'll say that uh, I I was uh, I tried to contribute to that as much as possible. I did write a uh, uh, a letter when they had open comments available, um, and I gave my input, and I'll share what that is uh, briefly into the deliberation process. So it's something I'm very invested in because I think it is uh, um, it has a big impact in medical education. So, all right. So in order to sort of give, many people have many different opinions on this, and that has become abundantly clear in the last week, and I have been exposed to many of those opinions in the last week. Um, so to, it's important that I explain where my biases are, because I have a very uh, clear way that I view things, and I know that it's not the way that many people view them, and so I don't want you to think that my opinions are uh, being presented here as um, unequivocal facts. Uh, I believe strongly in them, but I think you have a right to evaluate where they came from. Uh, to that end, I am a teacher. That's the probably the biggest part of my identity. I was, um, when I was a kid, I didn't have a strong cultural background. I don't have a strong tie to my schools or to any particular place that I've lived or that I'm from, though I'm partial to Texas because I spent a lot of time there. Um, but when I dropped out of high school to work full-time as a martial arts apprentice, I was being trained as a teacher. And teaching my master's teaching is something that made me who I am today. And I've also seen teaching as this beautiful thing that we've used to empower so many people. We used to work with children who schools and other studios would say, we can't work with this kid. They're not ready yet. We would take them in. We would try. And we could make differences for them. Not everybody turned into Bruce Lee, but you know, the majority of people, even if they had learning disabilities or attitude problems or personality disorders, we were able to do something or other to empower them, empower them at least a little bit towards their own goals. And that was my, the foundation of my, my worldview. And it still is that there is, that there's only two types of things, the things that you can do and the things that you can't do yet. Meaning that if you work hard enough, you can do pretty much anything. And it, it's not really a, life isn't about figuring out what you can and can't do and just kind of accepting it. It's about deciding what are the things that are worth investing your life into. So you can do anything, so you have to pick what, what really matters. And that mindset, that way of thinking, is something that has been explored extensively by a scientist called Dr. Carol Dweck. She's out of Stanford, and she's written a book called Mindset, and she's given some TED Talks, and her work is absolutely beautiful. And her work elucidates the difference between growth and fixed mindset. Growth mindset is what I just shared with you. It's the idea that you know, failure is a challenge. There's no such thing as impossibility, just infinite possibility. And the way that you think about yourself is um, as just just pluripotent person who can invest effort where they want to invest and expect that they will get fulfillment and happiness from that progress, from that growth. Not necessarily from, you know, uh, getting into this program or making this salary, but just that process of continuous growth. And... The fixed mindset would be, um, I got a C, therefore I'm stupid. I got an A, therefore I'm smart. I got into Harvard, therefore I'm smart. I got into not Harvard, therefore I'm less smart. That type of very, what it sounds like, fixed, fixed thinking. And so when I was working as a martial arts instructor, I still work as a martial arts instructor, um, as I've taught and as I continue to teach, I realize that the single biggest predictor of success is the growth mindset and things related to that. Purposefulness, um, self-concept, um, just these things that determine how a person responds to failure. How do they interact with societal expectations? 
how do they set goals for themselves? How do they recover from, from, from losses, that type of thing? So this is an approach that I have been very fortunate to be able to use to work with students from around the country through my MCAT teaching, through my public speaking and uh, life coaching and you know, all the efforts I do, the servant leadership community. And everybody I work with, I've been so privileged to um, sort of people share with me very intimate parts of their life and their struggles and their victories. And I get to see why they happen. I get to see why people get out of bad circumstances and how they get into good ones. And when they're in good circumstances and things goes wrong, I get to make my own observations about why that might have been. And I get to work with people about that. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I do all of that is, again, because I'm a teacher. My, my purpose in life is personal excellence and service. It's to be my best self and to use that to empower other people to do it too. Because being your best self feels fantastic and helping people feels fantastic. And human dignity is a fantastic thing. And when you inspire it in the world around you, your life gets better. It, th there's just no other way I would want to live. So that's my background. That, that's my priority. I don't really care how many digits are in my bank account. I don't really care um, what names are or are not on my CV. And consequently, I don't really care about those aspects in my students' lives. If I have a client or a student who um, they're in a situation where being financially independent matters to them, then I really care about their finances. If they don't care about that, I don't care either. If, if they're in a circumstance where going to school matters to them and, and getting good grades matters to them, I care about that. But if they are, if their goals don't really align with academic standard met metrics of success, I, I don't care about that. Okay? So there, in, in my view, there, there is no, um, prestige is a myth. Success is not something that your parents tell you what it means or your school tells you what it means or your society tells you what it means. Those things play a factor, but you have to decide what success is. And I think that people who do not do that disadvantage themselves when it comes to being happy. Okay. So I think that's enough background for me to explain some of the arguments that have been going on and what I think about them. So let's see, how did I put this in order? <clears throat> when I wrote during the open comment period to Incas, I made a couple of arguments. One of the arguments I made is based on the observation that SAT scores correlate with parental income. MCAT correlates with SAT. USMLE correlates with MCAT. So a lot of the time you have people in undergrad who think they are God's gift to scholarship. And in reality, they might be fantastic, but they're fantastic because they had good circumstances growing up. Other people are fantastic because they, they worked hard, and, and most people you know, whether they had those backgrounds or not, it's their hard work that really mattered. Um, but the, the, the point here is we use these metrics to define good versus bad sometimes. And it's damaging to ourselves. I have students who, they're doing great. They're really doing fantastic. And then they get a bad test score. And they're just emotionally distraught. And I think, yeah, we can fix that by instilling growth mindset. But at the same time, why are we encouraging that as a society? And why are we selecting for test scores when so often it correlates with things you couldn't control, i.e. your socioeconomic status? I remember one uh, particular student I worked with who was working 60 hours a week during undergrad, did a fantastic job. She had like a 3.5, 3.6 or something. Um, that's really, really good. And she was really, really smart. But because of her circumstances, she didn't have the sort of um, sort of 
shiny everything ducks in a row type of application. I still think she could do great, but she hasn't applied yet. But that's just an example of how this person is worried about a 3-5. And on paper, you see a 3-5, but then you realize she got a 3-5 while working full-time plus, right? That's impressive. Um, I've had students who are fantastically intelligent, but their thought process doesn't lend itself to standardized exams. Now, you can teach that. Anybody can do well at a standardized exam. That's the premise of my, my job as an MCAT teacher. Um, but is it necessary? Does it really measure what you think it measures? Which brings me to my next point. So the first point was USMLE, I feel, disadvantaged certain people. Not that they couldn't overcome it, but it's a barrier that doesn't need to be there. And here's my second point. When I came to medical school, I would go to all of these interest group meetings and residency directors and residents and uh, physicians would talk about what do we look for in someone who wants to come into our field. And so many of them would say number of publications and USMLE score. Now, I think that, that there's a lot of sort of flaws in that argument, but that's not the f point of this video. Let's assume that that's what's going on at some programs, because it is at some programs. The USMLE is supposed to be an operationalized measure of your fund of clinical knowledge, your fund of applicable clinical knowledge, right? And your number of publications is supposed to be a surrogate for your productivity. My argument is that both of those things are a more direct measure of something I would call compliance, right? So if you hear that these are the things that matter and then you go and do them, you are compliant. And the more you comply, the better you do. Because at a certain point, everybody, like I said, my belief is that anybody, most anybody, is intelligent enough to do most things if only they find it worth it and they put in the time and they study in the right way and they prepare in the right ways. So it's not really a useful measure. And I would ask them, I say, so, okay, USM Elite, great, I'm going to work on that. Um, do you find that that correlates with bedside manner, clinical skill, surgical skill, anything like that? No. Before it was out of my mouth, nine out of ten people I ask, no, we just have many applicants, we have to stratify them somehow. So you might say, well, that's a pretty arbitrary, but, you know, benign measure. Um, but I believe that it incentivizes thoughtlessness. So I told you that purpose, why sh I can do anything, why should I do that, right? That type of thinking is so important. And when you make it, uh, make so much of career advancement about things that don't matter, that don't actually improve a person's ability to do the things that matter to them, I think that is a detriment to mental health. So that's my second argument. And that was what I sent to Incus. My third argument is what it does to academic culture. When I was a first year medical student, uh, one of my professors shared with me a request that he got from one of his classes, which was, can you please tie your lecture slides to pages in a book called First Aid? First Aid is a uh, USMLE study resource which is compiled chiefly by medical students. They send in what they think is high yield and it goes in the book. And like I said, I'm a teacher. For me, every time I get up in front of a class, it is the performance of my lifetime. It matters to me so much. For hours before, I'm thinking about what are the questions I'm going to ask them to help them think? What are the jokes I'm going to make? What are the metaphors I'm going to try? And then afterwards, for days, I'm agonizing about what went right, what went wrong, because it really matters to me. This professor loved teaching. And to hear him have to circumscribe his art, to, to, to um, not circumscribe it, to, to limit it, to tie it to the um, format of, of this book, which is 
it's, it's really not a fantastic book. It was, the 2019 edition was pulled from our school's library because of how many um, mistakes were in there. And uh, when you look at it, it's just, um, there, there's, it doesn't offer a whole lot of wisdom. It's a lot of knowledge, and it's a format that works for people, but it, it's, um, it's not something that teachers should have to obey. And these teachers are people who are taking time, they could be making so much money, they could be helping so many patients, they could be spending time with family, and they don't have much of that time, and they're using it to teach us. And for us to say, yeah, let's limit your degrees of freedom because of this exam, which we've already established doesn't really measure anything that actually matters in the long term, that didn't sit right with me. And so the teacher side aside, the other part of the culture is the students. We have first-year medical students, first-year medical students who are doing hundreds and thousands of flashcards per day. And I'm not exaggerating. Some of them do upwards of 1,800. That's just one number one person said in 1,800 flashcards in a day. When I walk into the lecture hall, if I'm five minutes late, then I look and I see all the people's laptops. And at least 80% of the class is doing flashcards in class. Now, you might say, well, that's just how they learn. But th there, there is ample evidence in adult learning theory, adult learning science, in that literature that states passive learning and active learning are different. Actively engaging with a teacher who is actively trying to teach you with guided questions and metaphors and that type of thing is a very different cognitively formative experience than sitting there and word associating and image associating with flashcards. And I know people who, re they are much more knowledgeable than me uh, in terms of the, the stuff that we're supposed to be learning, and they swear by memorization, and they vehemently disagree with me, and that's fine. This is just me explaining my perspective. Um, and, and then I might say, well, it's also disrespectful for students to be doing that, but then what we're expected to do to advance our careers to the next stage we want to get to is it, it's out of phase with lecture. We're just supposed to be able to do well on the exam. And if a student says, well, I know that this will do well on the exam, why should I take the risks to engage with lecture? So I don't even fully blame the medical students in the context of the system that we've set up. So there's the cultural issue. And then... So those were uh, those th those are those are the big ones, right? The indirect selection against socioeconomic status, I think, is a big one. The fact that it's not a useful measure, and the effect it has on culture for teachers and students. Right? I probably haven't been as articulate as I could be in explaining how profound those things have been. Um, how profoundly negative those impacts have been on the U.S. Emily. Um, but that'll do for that background. I know this is a long video, but this is a, a deep topic, and I don't want to address it again. So, the, U, the NBME announced we're going to pass fail in 2022. And as you might have concluded by now, it was just Christmas in February for me. I thought, this is a fantastic step. This is a fantastic step towards a better state of medical education. And again, for me, human dignity is a big thing. Medical student burnout, depression, suicide. That is, those are the things that drive me crazy. Those are the things that I need, think need to be fixed. At, if, if it's to the cost of time for residency directors or for the cost of whatever systemic changes we have to make to facilitate this change, that's fine. Because mental health physical health, human dignity is infinitely more important to me than licensure and career advancement, okay? <clears throat> so what are the student arguments? The, the sort of co uh, common theme is, how do I distinguish myself now? And here's where this is going to turn into just an absolutely violent rant. When a student says that to me, and I'm looking at them, I'm looking at 
20 some odd years of, of investment of parents, teachers, that individual society into producing the human being that is in front of me. I see talent. I see passion. I see natural affinities. I see likes and dislikes and um, loves and, and hatred and, and just all these aspects of a human being that coordinate to form this locus of infinite potential. This person who, if they saw what I saw in them, and if they developed that every day, they could become more than anybody ever expected they could be. Because I'm a teacher, and that's how I see the world. And that's how I've interacted with the world. And my students have proven me right again and again and again. They surprise me and delight me with their tremendous capabilities again and again and again and again. And for someone to be in front of me saying, how do I distinguish myself now that there's no standardized measure? Are you out of your mind? How hard it is for me to hear that someone has so little self-worth that they think they need to compete in an average metric? In kindergarten, I learned you can't compare apples and oranges. Apples and oranges, I would say they're more similar than any two human beings. We are... Human individuality is peerless. There's nothing quite like it. And so this hyper-focus on how do we objectively compare everyone together? You don't. Because if you do that, they're not actually human beings. You're comparing things about them, but you're not comparing them. And the issue is, from grade school and up, we have broken the growth mindset. We have broken dignity, purposefulness, individuality. And that's why we have such poor mental health. We have epidemics of... of, of, of depression, of anxiety. I can't tell you how many times I meet with students and they think they have academic troubles, but what they have is generalized anxiety disorder. And what we have to work through is a complete lack of self-care and self-worth and, and inability to see their own purpose. And it's wrong that we've done that to them, that we do that to each other. It's, it's just morally reprehensible. So... I was speaking to a, um, a student, at, he's a very, very, very accomplished guy at a prestigious, which again I think is a myth, a prestigious institution, and he, I mean, published in, in amazing journals, has amazing skill sets, and he's a great personality, fantastic, brilliant human being, great sense of humor, and he's saying, you know, since I'm taking time to do um, a PhD, when I apply, I'm going to be competing with people who don't have to t study hard for the USMLE because it's a pass-fail. And so I don't think I can compete with them. Really? Everything going for him? And he's worried about that? And on the other hand, I have people at uh, schools that they think are less prestigious, which again, I think is a myth. And they're saying, how can we compete with the people at more prestigious schools? So the people at prestigious school are freaking out about competing with the others, and the people at the others competing with, they're all freaking out. So it's really just an underlying neuroticism, because we've been trained to be neurotic throughout the entirety of our education. It's a neurotic community. Panicking is a, a, uh, like a social pastime for, for academics. And it's just horrible. It's horrible that these people are going through life without realizing how fantastic they are. And I don't mean having big egos. I mean just seeing what they're capable of. Just believing that they're able to do the things they want to do. And they don't need permission. They, do, they don't need the permission of an admissions committee to do what they want to do. I've, I've been rejected from so many things and it, it's, it's fine. I've been rejected more times than I've been accepted. 
just learn and move on. You don't need people's permission. And that's freedom is when you realize that. And so that to me as a teacher is just something horrible that, oh my gosh, how did we allow people to become this way? This is our fault and it's a failure. But then I think as a as somebody who who is working every day to become a physician, my calling to the honors is based on the fact that doctor comes from the Latin infinitive docere, to teach, the infinitive, to teach. It's a superlative form of teaching to me. With surgery, you're educating the body with your own hands. With medicine, you're retraining the body. You're giving it a crutch so that it can recover. That's what it should be anyway. You are teaching people to live, to have good health behaviors, to exercise, to sleep well, to diet well. It's sacred. It's a, it's a sacred trust. People, I'm always just humbled. People listen to me. And how can that not humble you? I'm responsible for the things that I say because people listen to them. And as a doctor, people listen to you even more. And yet, the way that we have gated that professional society is through TV building. Test scores, grades. You can have a 4.0 GPA, 528 on the MCAT, 90th percentile US MLE score, but when you're in the operating room and something new happens, something that isn't in the textbook, something that you did not expect, there is no indication that you'll know what you're doing. You need critical, quick thinking. You need the empathy to understand what your team is feeling and to rally them and to get them on the same page to fix the problem. You need the people skills and again, the empathy to engage with the patient's family and with the patient to explain what happened. You need the street smarts to understand the uh, procedural and the legal framework in which you're going to have to deal with that for the benefit of the patient, for the hospital, and for yourself. You need time management skills so that you can honor your personal obligations, your personal health, your familial obligations, and at the same time, the obligations to your parent, to your patient, to your profession, to all the other things you're doing. You can't measure those things with tests. And you say, well, how can you measure them? You can take the time to really evaluate a person's words, their personal statements, their applications, their interview presentation. And you might say people can fox those things. As I've been an admission consultant for several years, and with every passing year, I am more and more convinced that you can't fox the integration of those elements to someone who really knows what to look for, for a whole committee who really knows what to look for. And I think the impetus for us as a society to have developed those skills of assessment has been removed by the standardized assessments. Let's see how far off track I've gotten. So... Practical advice, okay, because that's what people have been asking for. Um, to the people who are worried because, say, they're MD-PhDs and they'll be applying against people who are in the pass-fail system, um, really look at yourself. If you're someone who's taking time off, if you're someone who's um, going to be in that gap and you're worried about who you're competing against, look at yourself and realize how capable you are. Stop comparing apples to oranges. Have some self-worth. Live an authentic life. Be passionate about the things that you're doing. And there is nobody who can compete with you at being you. Take a risk on yourself. Because if you don't do that, how can you expect employers or schools to do that for you? 
You have to take the risk at being unapologetically you and being good at it. And it works out. To the people at the old schools and schools that you think are not prestigious because the magazine called US News and World Report doesn't rank them highly and that's a whole separate video. Um, if you came into medicine to be prestigious, please drop out and do something else. If you came into medicine to be prestigious and make money, and it could be an aspect, maybe that's something you enjoy, it's okay if you enjoy it, but if that's why you're here, get out. If, on the other hand, you fall into the majority of sincere, wonderful people who came into medicine to help people, then realize that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, whether you learn that fact at Harvard or at St. George's or at Stanford or University of Illinois or whatever. The science you learn will be the same. You're going to learn probably from the same textbooks as everyone else, and if you're not, you can just buy the textbook. So I've been to state schools, community colleges, Ivy League schools, and I have found that it's all just PowerPoints. The only difference is not based on institution, it's based on teacher. It's based on how passionate that person is and how good a job they do at making you feel inspired about what they're teaching. And you'll find that everywhere. And you'll find the opposite, apathetic, mediocre teaching everywhere. It's always going to be a mix. The doctor you become has nothing to do with your scores and it has nothing to do with the prestige. If you're worried about how am I going to show off so that I can get into a top residency, what does top mean first off? Think for a second. It means nothing. You are going to be as good a doctor as you make yourself. You have exactly the same opportunity as anybody else. And if it's not formalized in your curriculum, make the opportunity. Write letters, find mentors, design projects, read books. Read books. We are in a time where information is infinitely available. And the information is the same that you're going to be taught anywhere. So if you're really worried about the quality of your education, then find the resources that you find are the best quality and use them. Be yourself and realize that when you go to residency, let's say that, let's say that you're right. Let's say that your personal excellence completely doesn't matter. That's wrong, by the way. But let's say that that style of thinking, it was actually correct. And you're relegated to some residency at a hospital that nobody's ever heard of. It doesn't matter because you're still taking care of homo sapiens human beings. You're taking care of human beings with medical problems, social problems, psychological problems, financial problems that are going to be similar. It'll differ by geography, it'll differ by the cities that you're in, but you, for every opportunity you lose, you're going to gain another one because that is human diversity and that's how it's going to work. If you invest yourself, give 100%, bond with your teachers, learn from their wisdom, you are going to get some advantage that no one else has. And that's true no matter where you are, whether it's Harvard or any other place. It, it, none of it matters, okay? To be clear, the only thing that a top program and a not top program have in, in different between them is whether or not your Uber driver is going to recognize it when you say the name of the hospital. It's not really something to live for. And to the people who are saying, well, no, this place has different research resources, this resource is that, that resource is... Stop thinking in such mediocre terms. I've met directors of departments at Mayo Clinic who went to Caribbean medical schools, and now they're directors of departments here with all the world-class resources and all that stuff. So if you're in a position where you didn't do well in undergrad, so you went to a school that you think isn't the best, work hard, go to a great residency, and if that doesn't work out, Work hard, go to a great fellowship, and if that doesn't work out, work hard. Make a brand for yourself. Do your research, publish good things, take great care of patients, and then go wherever you want to go and use the resources you want to use. There are people who are made by the places they go, by the places they go, and there are people who make the places they go. The people who founded these universities, who founded these schools of thought, who wrote the initial papers and did the initial work. And the places that you think are so famous are famous because of the hard work of those 
people who did it at a time when the place they were doing it was nothing. It was nothing but a place where they happened to be where they could do the things that matter. Stop neuroticizing over something as trivial as a standardized exam in a profession where life and death hangs in the balance every single day. I have undergrads messaging me about this. That's the gist of it. It really doesn't matter. If it was pass fail or not pass fail, you should be working your hardest in a balanced way without losing sight of who you are, why you're here, and your your own health. That shouldn't change. So whether it's pass fail or not is a useless question. It shouldn't change what you're doing. So I hope that that was useful to somebody. It was certainly cathartic for me. Probably, yeah. All right. I'm off. Please reach out with any questions. And live your best life. You deserve that. And nobody can stop you from doing it. Have a good day.